What up, YouTube? Ever since Shelly and I created the New York City Teaching Fellow videos, we have two, I wanted to create this video basically explaining why I quit teaching. If you came across this video, either you're thinking about teaching, you're thinking about the fellows, you want to quit, um, I am going to give you my top 10 reasons to why I gave up on the fellows on the first year and I quit teaching. Stay tuned. All right, before I begin, I want to give you guys a bit of a background. I will tell you how I was let go and how I quit. It was very unprofessional on both sides and it's a pretty interesting story, so stick around for that. I worked in the DOE for over 10 years. I started as a school aide to a community assistant to um, helping in the office as admin, assistant deaning, to teaching and sub-teaching. But my situation with teaching and the fellows I'm in the D75 setting, so students with physical mental disabilities. Um, I was in a 12 one to one, 12 students, one teacher, one para if they need a para. When I was given my class, I was a new classroom, so I was the only standardized kindergarten through second classroom. So we did have other K through seconds, but they didn't have to take the standardized test. My students needed them. So it was basically a test run. I was a test run in the school. That should tell you a lot. So for my first, first, first reason as to why I quit teaching is paperwork. If you don't like paperwork, uh, teaching isn't for you. Every night I was expected to do lesson plans for every subject. So that means math, science, whatever you're going to teach. A lesson plan is a script. You need to write everything you're going to say anything the kids are gonna say or you expect them to say, all the materials you're gonna use, and what sequence is gonna be said, how you're gonna put everything together. Lesson plans could be anywhere from a page, a page and a half to three pages, depending on how you do it. But you were expected to do it every night and have it somewhere in the classroom. Now, some teachers get by by making a generic one and changing it up a bit, you'll end up learning, but when you're a first year teacher and your principal walks in and you don't have a lesson plan. Hmm. Also, while I was in the fellows, I had to do lesson plans. I had to do homework. I had to do classwork. I had to do bo um, post boards, discussion boards and all of that. So each of those things have deadlines and that adds up. You also, as a D75 special ed teacher, you have IEPs, ABA, behavioral intervention plans. Uh, you have to create worksheets, you have to print the worksheets, you have to differentiate it. So you have to have so many different things and you know have it all together by the time you teach. It's very time consuming. I didn't get to the EdTPA. That's why it was the reason I quit the EdTPA. Uh, Shelly, my fiance, did it. It was about 80 pages. And Capstone. So those things I wasn't ready to take on. Number two, even though I was in the Board of Ed for 10 years before teaching, I went in there with no experience. Outside of the classroom, teachers, no one really knows what the hell teachers go through. Everyone thinks it's all easy, you teach a subject, one plus one is two, you get weekends off, you get summers off. Um, you know, Board of Ed and the school tries to give you some training, but it's basically throwing a book of information at you and you're expected to learn that and if you don't, they're always gonna throw it in your face and tell you, yeah, but when we had the PD or a meeting, you should have learned this. It's not easy, and especially as a new teacher, first year teacher, you never really have the best classroom. You're always given the, not the worst kids, but you know, 95% of the time, you're given a pretty bad class. And they're like, hey, we might as well try someone new with these kids, let's see what happens. So going in there with no experience and walking into your first day of class, you just stand there like, Oh man, what am I doing? How am I going to teach these kids? The kids don't know who you are. They don't, you know, they're testing you out. You're testing them out. The staff don't know who you are. So the first year is, it was tough. It was a new experience. Number three, as to a reason why I quit is you always have to be on your toes on a teacher. You have to be careful what you say. You have to be, be careful what you do. Everyone is watching. Everyone's a mandated reporter. You slip out and curse Ooh, you know kids are gonna snitch you out if you got older kids and they don't like you they're snitching you out they're recording you you know 
today's date, you gotta be careful and always on your toes. You can also have the, oh, I got you moment where the principal or AP is walking into your class seeing if you're teaching and gotcha, you know, it, it'll be the end of you. They're gonna be on your butt after that and it happened with me. Um, I'll get to that later. You have to be careful where you drink or go out to have fun. You, like, you always gotta be on your toes because you never know who's watching. Number four is one of the biggest reasons why I was done and it's the right way to teach. And what I mean by that is I can't stand the observations. I can't stand the common core or the right way to teach is which basically they tell you you have to teach every kid the same way pretty much and only differentiate the worksheets. And I had D75, all my kids were behavioral uh, mixed with autism. So right way to teach, my principal wanted me to basically be like, hey, this is one plus one equals two. This is how I got it, yada, yada, yada. Split into the groups on their levels. Try it on your own with the paras. Come back, we're gonna review it as a class and you know, see if you got it right or whatnot. The problem with that was my kids didn't really like each other. They were all behavioral and emotional. So if a kid looked at another kid wrong, they were ready to fight. So in my classroom, it didn't work out. It was just one big group. And I like to do a lot of videos of counting and ABCs and things like that and hands-on approach and things that relate to their life. And the observations were bad. Now, I was barely getting a passing grade. I think the level was one through four, four being the best, one being the worst where you can get fired. I think the minimum you can get is like a 2.6 and I got like a 2.61. Like it didn't trigger in my head if my students are learning, how am I teaching wrong? And that's one of the biggest reasons I was just like, yeah, how can I do this for 30 years if I'm teaching my kids the right, if I'm teaching my kids, but it's not the right way. Number five, um, every teacher will probably tell you, there's never enough time slash never enough resources. No matter what, you work eight to three in a school. It's never just eight to three. You're never gonna just be like, oh yeah, don't worry about it. After 3.10, I'm going to be home and I'm free. I'm no longer a teacher. That's not, that's not the way it goes. You gotta go home and lesson plan like I said earlier. You got to go find these materials. Most of the time, the materials the school doesn't have. So teachers have to go out of pocket and buy pencils for the kids and buy notebooks for the kids and buy paper for the copy machine and buy ink for the printer. Things just that you wouldn't think about. Teachers have to pull out of pocket, create those lesson plans, put them in a script, the lesson plan, post it somewhere in the classroom, make sure their IEP goals are um, on point and you don't miss any deadlines, that you have the ABA, everything needs to be documented. So if a kid starts spazzing out, quick somebody document that like and if you don't everyone's expecting the teachers to be perfect and if you miss out and less than perfect you basically effed up like they look at you like but, but why didn't you do this maybe because I have 10,000 things on my mind that I can't remember to document that a kid said the F word if you forget one little thing either the parents or you know the admin look at you and it's just like what are you doing even though you're trying your absolute best and it just becomes very overwhelming and then when you go home and have to get all this paperwork together there is barely any family time any free time any time for you to go to gym because you're just drained and exhausted <laughs> teachers do a lot number six this is kind of a one of the low reasons of why i quit but it's something a lot of people don't think about before going to teaching and it kind of happens in every job but number six is because of the politics that's a big one but the lesser one is learning the unwritten rules in every school you're gonna have clicks and in my head none of that should have should be happening in a school i think like in a school environment everyone needs to kind of work it together you know create a good school environment uh school pride you know things like that but I've worked in six different schools, from school aid to subbing to teaching, and it always seems that there's always different cliques. For example, the teachers don't hang out with the office staff. The office staff doesn't want to talk or be nice to the teachers. And I was always in the middle of, you know, like 
some rumor and I didn't really mess with a lot of people I just stuck to my own clique and that doesn't sit right in my head like you would want everyone to be together and work together and if you try to do anything like that every some people look at you like you're weird like no just they basically work for a paycheck and it didn't fit right in my head so when this happens the unwritten rules you got to learn who's a snitch who you can't vent to because that snitch is going straight to the principal like oh this guy doesn't like you this woman doesn't like you and they're gonna believe the person who's been there the longest and you're just new so you have to learn these unwritten rules and if you don't learn them quickly it's going to be a tough year and it was in my own classroom as to the unwritten rules i came in there being 27 or something like that and i had 12 other adults in my room and one of them were 18 19 years old uh para all the way to being 50 years old i think 52 53 and it didn't work out because in a D75 school, a lot of the paras that you get are sub paras. So you never will have a set staff in your room. You get sub paras and there's different people every week. A lot of the older co-workers didn't listen to me because I was just a kid. And oh, that could be my son. I don't have to listen to them. I've been here longer than them. And it's just a lot of politics in there that was just like, we're here for one goal, and that one goal is to teach our students. It didn't work out. I got along with a few of my paras, but a lot of them I didn't. And I was told to control them. And that no experience thing was just, it was tough to control 12 adults when you never really were a boss or manager or things like that for adults you've never seen before. Number seven, this was one of the biggest reasons I quit very limited to no creativity at all anymore as a teacher and this is where I'm going to tell you a little bit of how I got let go and how I quit I had kindergarten through second I used to have a behavioral chart and every period my students worked from a one through ten like score if they were great they got a ten if they were okay they got like an eight if they were bad they got zero to five between there. At the end of the week, I was also the cool teacher, where right before busing, you get 20 minutes to get ready after lunch, have free time, which, which you're not supposed to have free time, but everyone gave them free time. Um, I did things like the Nintendo Switch just came out. I bought the brand new Switch with like four or five controllers. Um, the best students in the class would play Mario Kart first two races, you know, the top one picks the stage, the character first. And the kids kind of respected it because if they were bad, they were like, oh, but if they even acted worse or you know got upset at that point, they couldn't play because they messed up their chance to play. Also had a choice of being on a tablet or picking Pokemon cards from a deck, any ones they want. They maybe pick two or three depending on their grade, giving their spot on the switch to someone else. Um, I had one girl, so she liked to collect all these frozen like things that I had and all that came out of pocket um, but it worked out where my behavioral kids weren't really having behavioral issues and the kids wanted to learn because hey at the end of the week we get to play the switch and I don't have a switch at home and this is brand new and I get to play the switch before my big brother and my father you know like the kids really loved it and it was only 20 minutes before busing what i taught one lesson was the caterpillar to butterfly as my science thing i went all year with no curriculum no guide to teach me how to teach or what to teach i was winging it the entire year and i came across the butterfly farm where you order it get caterpillars and um you know, raise them to be butterflies. I went to the school garden and released them at the end of the year. And I tied it in to Pokemon, where there's a Caterpie, Metapod, and Butterfree, which Caterpie is a caterpillar, Metapod is the chrysalis slash uh, cocoon, and Butterfree is a butterfly. And um, my AP one day walked in on my prep and said, Oh, what are you teaching? And I, you know, was excited. I'm like, hey, um, 
here, look, I'm doing the caterpillars, the butterflies, look, we're raising them, they're right here, they were in cocoons at that point. And she's like, oh, this is cute, why are you doing it? And I was like, huh? And I was like, she's like, why are you doing it? I was like, science, and it also comes, like, I could have them write about how a butterfly is created, you know, things like that. So I was going into it, like, excited, and she's like, who told you to do this? And I was just like, uh, no one, I'm still waiting on curriculum. Mind you, we're in, like, May. Um, the entire year that I was told they were going to give me and I've been waiting, I've been emailing, I even told my fellows coach, um, I'm waiting. And she's like, no, you can't be doing this. And she basically demanded I give her a lesson plan every night at 9 p.m. Mind you, I'm not even out of school as a fellow at that point, so that's what I told her. I was like, I'm not even out of school. I'm not home till about 11, 12 o'clock. And she's like, I need a lesson plan every night. When I gave her some lesson plans at 9 p.m., she would give them back to me at like 9.30 and says no, and say, no, revise this or change this, and I, it became frustrating. I had to do schoolwork and homework, and she's emailing me about lesson plans, and it just became overwhelming. I still took my kids out. I showed them the Pokemon scene where Caterpie evolves into Metapod and Metapod evolves into Butterfree so that they understood, they understood like evolution and how they turned into something else. And at the end, we went to the garden and released it. And another AP was like, this is cute, this is amazing, send me pictures. And the other AP was just like, this is dumb, what are you doing? Why, why are you teaching this? I wasn't taught to be free anymore. I was taught to just teach one way and the way you're supposed to teach it, like if you're an army vet or something, like straight by the book. And it didn't work out because my kids didn't like it. They didn't like it at all and it became a mess in my classroom. Number eight is one big one. There is no motivation and there is no self-love or alone time like I stated earlier. What I mean by that is I used to wake up every morning tired and dreading going to work. Teachers have weekends off but I'm telling you Sundays they commit to paperwork and grading and uh, lesson plans and fixing or looking at IEP goals and getting ready for Monday and they dread Sunday because they would don't want to work Monday. I, I used to drag myself to work. I used to go straight home and knock out. I was exhausted. I would go to class exhausted. I would come home on a train knocked out sleeping. Somehow waking up right before my train stop and I didn't want to go to the gym like I stated earlier. I didn't want to go out to family times. I didn't want to go out to play basketball or go out. The only thing I wanted to do after work was hit up happy hour with some of my coworkers and vent and joke about, oh look what happened, this is what happened, and go home, relax, and think about school the next day or work. And it's just like, it took over my life and it wasn't enjoyable at all. And teachers do love their students a lot but the way the school system is ran right now is just training depressing and it doesn't work out for me it didn't work out for me just because i'm a teacher and i'm teaching kids and i'm helping the future no it's just it wasn't fun number nine reason is basically the blind leading the blind but i cannot see i'm legally blind and what i mean by that is this probably is just in my school i know there's other schools that have great principals and great office staff and great chemistry but the one I worked at it didn't um, and what I mean by that my principal was the blind leading the blind teachers only they only were working for paychecks there were a few teachers that really did care and everyone hated the principal what I mean by the blind is she was the principal of a d75 school which had five other buildings, other sites. So she had to go visit other sites periodically or whatever and at different times. So imagine five different sites, 10 to 12 different classrooms in each, and you're just that one classroom. You really think she's going into your classroom more than twice a year, maybe three times? No. She also wanted to be my observation person. Came in there, once in the fall, once winter, 
and then again like in the spring and then I had my AP do another observation on me but she didn't know my kids she didn't see how long how far they've come and she didn't realize what population I had so to her she would basically tell me are you even trying like I said before teachers need to be perfect or they're looked at as they're not trying hard enough I did not get along with my principal because I don't understand how you can go into a classroom twice a year three times a year and think you know that classroom setting and man my kids are so focused on having the same thing every day the moment some somebody random comes in even in gen and in gen ed they're just like why is this person here what are they doing here um why are they watching you and it becomes awkward unless you prep the kids and be like hey i'm getting observed be on your best behavior i give you pizza at the end of the day you know kindergarten kids to second grade all in one i couldn't do that like i can't bribe my kids because they're gonna be like Mr. Perez, Mr. P, are we getting pizza after she leaves? Right in front of her. It just never worked. And it became annoying. Then I would get called into her office saying, why did you say this? Why did you do this? And I didn't click. Uh, I didn't click at all. And I couldn't agree with the blind leading the blind if you didn't, if you couldn't understand my classroom setting. Number 10 is the final straw I had. And it was, the school drained my passion. And like I said, I hated Mondays. I was tired Sundays. I didn't want to go. I was no longer motivated. I wanted to use all my sick days. I wanted to use all my personal days. I just didn't care anymore. And it sucked because if teachers quit, they're going to tell you this. Students are a small reason of why you quit. but. 95% of the time they genuinely love their students and even the bad ones like I had one bad kid and I miss that kid I miss that kid every day and I still have my one of my classroom parents sending me pictures of them and how they're growing up and I genuinely had love for those kids like I wanted to get them toys that they never had and you know make them excited about school but the way the school politics and system is ran, it just, it just drained me. It didn't make me want to be excited about teaching. It made me feel I couldn't do that 30 years without being happy. Um, and it took to the point where I was just done. This is where I get to the point where I was let go. Um, I finished all my observations and I had a, a really tough year um, but I was excited that I got developing which was a 2.62 or whatever it was right one point point zero one or 0 0.02 over the minimum and you know which the end of May going into June I'm excited and I'm teaching my kids about something about the earth and I forgot what it was about water and something and my AP, who was the cool AP, um, comes in and says, oh, they need you in the office. So they're like, go to the principal's office. So I go in and um, basically she tells me to sit down. They wait for the AP to come in and I'm handed a letter. And the letter was basically saying that they didn't need my services anymore. Thank you, yada, 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 you know basically saying we rather go on without you and that crushed me because outside of everything when I started with my students they didn't they couldn't tell you six or seven letters in the alphabet the way I was teaching hands-on and all the uh, hands-on and motivating them with things that they like like you know Pokemon cards or tying in lessons with cartoons they watched my kids were reading on uh, the A to Z level C books and I did that from teaching the alphabet and motivating them to work and you know I sat in that office and she's just like you have anything to say and I was just like no and she's like are you sure that means you're not coming back I was like sure I guess she wanted me to cry or be sad or whatever and I just walked out and 
she basically told me that there was no more spots available, right? And I go into my office, I go into my classroom and, you know, I have 10, 11 adults in there as well as myself. And I go to my classroom para who's uh, a really good friend of mine and I tell her, I got fired just now. And she's, you know, I'm a jokester, so she didn't believe me. And I'm like, no, I got fired. So I uh, gave her the letter and she read it. She's like, are you serious? That's when it started to hit me because I started looking at my students and I'm like, these kids don't know that I just got fired and I had parents wanting me to be their, their teacher next year. And, you know, I, I genuinely cared for those kids. I wanted to see them do good, you know. And 10 minutes later, uh, right outside my classroom, there was, a, there was classroom assignments for the next year, three sheets from what classroom teacher to what parents are gonna be in there and what rooms. So the reason I found that out, other parents came in the room from other classrooms like, oh, what room are you in next year? What room are you in? So everyone's excited and I'm sitting there like, what? And I come outside to see the paper. There's three vacancies for teachers, three. And I was just like, wow. Like you, you basically did that. So for the next week, I had people coming in like, are you leaving? Are you not coming back? What happened? Why is your name not on there? Why, why is this? Why is that? Did you tell them you're not coming back? And I still had three or four weeks left of that. And it was embarrassing. So I just never came back. I quit and didn't show up to the point where I came this last day to collect my things. My principal didn't even know my name. She called me Mr. Rivera. My last name is not Rivera. And um, I just lost it from there. And I didn't want to start a new school year or a new classroom in a different school not knowing how to teach because that's what I was told the entire year. And I quit. I went through a little thing with my daughter leaving. I headed the a bit of a depression, it was sad. And then I get a nice email in August. And mind you, I was told the entire year I was terrible. <laughs> my kids didn't know the alphabet. They didn't know how to read. I get an email saying all my students passed the standardized test. So the entire year I was told I was bad, my kids passed the test. So the city boosted my rating from developing, barely developing, to an effective teacher. And that was just the like email I got that was just like, are you serious? Like I knew I wasn't wrong, but it made me feel that I couldn't do teaching anymore and that I don't regret leaving because based on who's your AP, who's your principal, who's whatever, it's just, I don't think the system has an idea of how to teach every kid now or what they're doing and teachers have it hard, they have it hard. And yes, they need teachers. Um, the Board of Ed needs good teachers, but if this is something you're thinking about, just make sure this is something you really wanna do. I do believe that they need genuinely help, they need a lot of help and good teachers to be there, but it just wasn't for me.